Welcome to Week 5, Lesson 5, Church Administration 201. The Ephesians 4 model is adapted from material originally presented by Dr. Leroy Thompson. I want to share with you a biblical model for ministry. That biblical model comes straight from the book of Ephesians. I don't know why that this is true, but it seems like I have preached more from the book of Ephesians than any other book in the Bible. Perhaps that would be explained by the fact that this particular book is especially helpful in terms of the church and how the church should behave as the church. The Ephesians 4 model basically has two parts. The power of ministry is found in chapter 4 of Ephesians, beginning with verse number 7. I'd like to ask you to get a copy of the Word of God, open it before you, and let's read this passage together. If you don't have your copy of the Bible, then perhaps you would like to stop this lecture for just a few moments, get your Bible, and then come back with it in hand. Ephesians 4, 7 through 10. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. The New Testament is the source for all of our philosophy of ministry. Ephesians 4 is the best model for ministry I think that we can find in the entire Bible. I mentioned that there are two parts of this model. Not only is there the power of ministry, but the people of ministry. And that's found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Now we'll look at these two elements a little more closely. Let's examine the power of ministry. Primarily you will find that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 7. The word for grace in the Greek language is haris. Every Christian has been given by God His grace. At the point of becoming a believer, when Jesus became your Savior, your Lord, then you received His haris. The result of receiving that gift is charis, that is charisma, we talk about it. The M-A ending in the Greek word means the result of. So the result of receiving the grace of God is that we have been given gifts. These gifts are to be the power that operate the ministry of the church. Too often churches operate in the strength of the flesh rather than the power of the Holy Spirit, rather than the power of the charis. The result of receiving charis is charisma. Charisma is a gift. The plural of charisma is charismata. From that we get our word charismatic. The church operates by the grace gifts of the Holy Spirit. Grace gifts are spiritual gifts bestowed on the believer at the time of salvation. A spiritual gift is a supernatural empowerment given by God to accomplish God-given objectives. They are not to be used on ourselves selfishly. They are to be used for the glory of God and for the edification of His people and the evangelization of the world. We do not serve out of technology, personalities, or techniques. No, there's no power in those. We serve out of the grace gifts given to us by the Holy Spirit. The church is a spirit-led body, and therefore it must operate with the power of God's Spirit using His grace gifts. The church must operate out of the giftedness of the people that he is called to be a part of that congregation. We cannot operate on the strength of our own abilities or personalities. But now what about the people of ministry? We read about the people of ministry in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. We see here that God has given gifts to people. He saves us first, He then gives us gifts to serve Him, and then we're given to the church itself. It is truthful to say 
that if you are a pastor or a worship pastor or a youth pastor, you are a gift of leadership to that church. So the leadership of a church is a gift. Some may want to return the gift, but nevertheless, you are a gift. Notice the words from the Greek language that help us to understand this. People are gifted by God and then given edokain, or it's the lemma for didomi. You are a gift to the church, and don't forget that. Leadership is God's gift to a particular church given to carry out the ministry. Since these spiritual gifts are so very important for the proper functioning of the New Testament church, where do we find the list for spiritual gifts? Well, there are four primary places that you will find a listing of spiritual gifts in the New Testament. Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Ephesians chapter 4, and also 1 Peter chapter 4, although I have not made a separate listing for 1 Peter chapter 4 in the list before you. Let's just look at each one of these. I'm not going to spend any time on them except just to simply point them out to you. In Romans chapter 12, the non-duplicating list would include exhortation, giving, leadership, mercy, prophecy, service, and teaching. And the proper use of one's spiritual gifts is essential to the functioning of a New Testament church. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the gift of administration, apostle, prophecy, discernment, faith, healing, helps, knowledge, tongues, and the interpretation of tongues is listed here, miracles, and wisdom. Again, the proper use of one's spiritual gifts is essential to the functioning of a New Testament church. Ephesians chapter 4 lists apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. We're going to spend more time on these gifts in just a few moments. And then others, celibacy, hospitality, martyrdom, missionary calling, and the call to poverty, which again is a spiritual gift given to some. Again, the proper use of one's spiritual gifts is essential to the functioning of a New Testament church. This is a listing of most of the spiritual gifts. I hope that you will become very familiar with them and know where they're found in the Scripture. This slide provides a slightly different view of the spiritual gifts. In the previous slide, we talked about the gifts as they related to a passage of Scripture. Here, I'd like for you to look at them divided into three commonly used categories. Service gifts, sign gifts, equipping gifts. First, under the service gifts, you'll notice apostle, discernment, helps, hospitality, martyrdom, celibacy, missionary, poverty, service. Now, some of those don't fit nicely in a neat package under that service gifts category, but this is where scholars have placed them over the years. Notice under the sign gifts, you find faith, prophecy, healings, knowledge, tongues, and the interpretation of tongues, miracles, and wisdom. And then the last category, they are the equipping gifts, apostle, prophet, evangelist, administration falls under the equipping gifts, leadership, and pastor-teacher. You will notice that I put pastor then slash teacher because I believe that that is the same spiritual gift, not pastor as a separate gift and teacher as a separate gift, although teaching is a gift. But I see that the role of the pastor and the calling of a pastor is both to be a pastor and teacher. So so you'll notice that pastor-teacher is placed together in this listing. As promised, I wanted to come back and talk about the equipping gifts. You'll see those listed there, apostle, prophet, evangelist, administration, pastor-teacher, and leadership. Let's deal with them one at a time. Apostle. It comes from the word apostolos. 
and there are varying views of the gift of the apostle. Some believe that it refers to the apostles of the first century only, that is, the twelve plus the apostle Paul. Another view is that they function just as they did in the first century, and we do have apostles here today. The third view is that they function through the apostolic writings, that is, through the biblical word that was written by their hand. And the last few, some minister in an apostolic manner, but not exactly like John, Peter, and James. I will share with you my view, but I will encourage you to develop and formulate your view after much thought and prayer. I believe that this refers to the gift in the first century of the gift of the apostles. And as a result, that gift is no longer practiced today in the technical sense that it was practiced in that day. And then there is the gift that we refer to as prophets, or prophetas. This is different from our traditional thinking. Prophets have a twofold task, foretelling the future, or prophesying or telling what is going to happen in the future. And that's about 10% of the work of a prophet, even in the Old Testament. Second, forthtelling or preaching the word to their world or their audience, and this made up about 90% of what the prophets did. We tend to think of forthtelling the future, but over 90% of the work of a prophet was to be a preacher to a congregation or to a region. The New Testament prophet was a preacher of the word. The New Testament prophet is one with the vision from God who sets the direction for the church to follow. For example, Agabus had a prophecy and it started the Palestine Relief Fund for the poor saints in Jerusalem. He was a fourth teller. Now you'll notice the third of these gifts is the evangelist. You angelistas. You angelistas. The evangelist is a good news teller or a good newser. It's someone who tells the good news, someone who presents the gospel. We get the word, of course, evangelist from the Greek. From Kittle's Theological Dictionary, we find that originally this word denotes a function rather than an office. In Ephesians 4.11, the evangelists are mentioned after the apostles. They are not just missionaries, for the word evangelist is a congregational word as well as a missionary word. They're not just missionaries, for as the word evangelist is a congregational word, so the leaders of the community also are called evangelists, not just missionaries overseas. His task was to preach the gospel. He is the primary equipper who is to entrust these teachings to faithful men who will be able to teach others also, according to 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. And then we have to turn to Titus chapter 1, verse 5, to look at a passage of Scripture that deals with the administration gift. That word is epideatho. In Titus 1, 5, we find this word. Titus is to set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city. That is, to go about the function of administrating the church and helping the church be organized to carry out the work of the church. And then you will notice pastor-teacher, poimain kai didaskalos. This teaching gift appears in the New Testament more often than any other except prophecy. A teacher is the one with the ability to explain clearly the things of God. He is not a prophet announcing new truth, but one who is able to expound the truth already given. Again, in Kittle's wonderful work, I quote, in Ephesians 4.11, the common article makes it plain that the dioscalos are identical uh, with the poimain. This lies in the nature of the case, for poimain is the one who is responsible for the life of the community. And therefore, dioscalos, in the wider sense, is a part of that office. The pastor-teacher is one office. There is only one article in front of the first word and not in front of the teacher. This means to pastor is to be a teacher. Today's church has divided the office, but we need to see it as a unified role of the pastor. 
All of these people have been given spiritual gifts, and they're to be equippers, equipping others. And then leadership, and again you have to go to Romans chapter 12, verse 8, and you find the word proisteme is the Greek word for leadership, and it means steering the ship from point A to B. We as leaders have the capacity of developing a vision and then helping the church, just like a ship, to go from point A to point B through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Now let me share with you just a few observations about the equipping gifts. Equipping gifts are given in order to help our lay people take hold of their spiritual gift and use it for the Lord. They may have more than one gift. They may have multiple spiritual gifts. And our job as ministers is to equip them to do the work of the ministry and to lead in ministries that would honor the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, these gifts may or may not be miraculous. In that sense, I want to make it very clear that I believe the greatest miracle of all is when a person receives Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, and they make that commitment, and they seal their destiny that they're going to heaven for all eternity ahead. And then it enables others to find their ministry. Often, our people think that the minister is the one that is to be engaged in ministry, but that model that I have tried to present today is a model that encourages the ministers to equip the lay people, and then the lay people will do the ministry for the Lord. Let me recap what we've learned today. We've talked about the Ephesians 4 model and how important it is for us to recognize that there is power for the ministry, and then there are people for the ministry who have been gifted by God to perform that work. We've looked at the word grace. We have identified the fact that every believer has at least one spiritual gift and most have several spiritual gifts that they should be using. We've talked about how the people of God should utilize their spiritual gifts to accomplish the work of God. And if the work of God is not accomplished through the use of spiritual gifts, that work will be worthless. We talked about the equipping gifts specifically today the gift of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, administration, the pastor-teacher, and leadership. And then we've talked about how to utilize these gifts to lead a church so that the lay people identify their spiritual gifts and then use them in the work of the ministry. Do you know your personal spiritual gift or gifts? Have you identified them? Are you clear about them? Are you sure about them? And then are you working in the strength of your giftedness?